You just met two of the main characters in the book of Proverbs, the wise man and the fool. Uh, we're going to be hearing a lot about them throughout this series. And next week, we're going to learn what characterizes a wise man or woman and what characterizes a foolish man or woman. So you'll want to be back for that next week. I've been challenged, encouraged at some of the wisdom things I see God doing, but also challenged by some of the foolishness I still see in my life as we continue to grow to be that wise man. I need to start in prayer because you know what? I got, I got to be honest with you. I don't have what it takes to present today's message. It's not because I'm sick or anything like that or I didn't prepare. I did. But what I'm going to talk about is so much bigger than any human being could ever properly describe. Uh, I'm going to admit before you right now that I cannot do it. Uh, but we're going to trust the Spirit of God to do something bigger than Pat Peglow. I pray often like this, I'm going to pray now with the spirit of the boy who brought the fish and the loaves to Jesus, and yet there was a multitude of people out there that need to be fed, and here just a few fish and a few loaves, and the disciples said, what is this for such a great need? That's the way I feel about today's message. I got my loaves, I guess I'm the fish, and uh, they're way too little for what our real need is for today. So let me open us in prayer and ask Jesus, to take what I've got, to break it and bless it and give it back and distribute it through me and by God's grace to be basketfuls left over for you to feast on all week long. So pray with me, would you? Father, I want to start by acknowledging uh, it's not just me, Lord. There is no man that is big enough or adequate enough in themselves to communicate accurately and fairly the important truth we need to bring today. And so, Lord, I, I do come like the boy with the fish and the loaves. I hand myself, I hand this message to you, I hand this service, I hand these people, we hand ourselves over to you, trusting you that you will take it, Lord, you will fill this place with yourself. As we sang it, the only thing I need right now is you, Jesus. And that's what we're saying. The only thing we need right now is you and your word. And that you would break open to us in our hearts and our minds today the word of life. God, would you be pleased to do things that last forever? God, would you make so clear in our hearts and minds what the key to wisdom is? Lord, that we will know it for the rest of our lives. We will carry it with us. And Lord, we will live that way. So I give this time and us over to you in faith and expectation. As you say, commit your ways to the Lord and he will do them. Commit your works to the Lord and he will establish them. God, we're committing over this Sunday morning. We're committing over this time to you. And we're going to walk in faith expecting you to do things that only God can do here this morning for the glory of Jesus in your name. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Simple question. Do you know where the starting line is to be wise? Where do you start? Every race has a starting line. If you want to win the race and get the prize and uh, all that, you need to get up to the starting line and you have to run the race as it was set up to win it. So the question is, do you even know where the starting line is? If we can't get to the starting line, we'll never be able to win the race of wisdom. If you're with us for the first time this morning, you're here, uh, we're, you're, you're here early in the series and that's a good thing. We just started a series that we're calling Ancient Wisdom for Modern Living. And we saw last week that the meaning of wisdom simply is this. It's the skill to live life well. It's that ability to handle life skillfully like an artist can paint a picture skillfully or like a, a craftsman can build their uh, whatever's in front of them that they're building with great skill. And that's the goal of this series. It's the goal of this book, that we can become people who live life skillfully. That's God's wisdom. 
And probably more important than just learning today what that starting point is, it's actually getting up to the starting line. You follow me? <laughs> we can all know what the starting line is, but in a race, unless you get on the starting line, you're not going to compete and you're not going to be a part of it. So today, as you not only learn, but once you step up to that starting line, you're going to be in a place not only to understand the heart of the book of Proverbs, but more important, you'll be able to understand the heart of wisdom, the heart of being able to live life skillfully. Where is the starting line? If you haven't opened your books yet, turn to Proverbs chapter 1. give you a second to get there because I want you to see the text. Starting in verse 2, we saw last week, this summarizes the whole purpose of the book. To know wisdom and instruction. To have a personal relationship an engagement and encounter with wisdom and instruction. That's the whole purpose of the book of Proverbs. As he moves on, he unfolds that for us in this section. But this book was written so that we can have a personal relationship in such a way that we call wisdom and instruction our personal, close, intimate friend. We'll look it down to verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Notice any connection there between the two passages? <laughs> this book was written to make us wise so that we personally would know wisdom and instruction, but look at what the fool does. The fool, on the other hand, is the person that despises it. He looks down upon wisdom instruction. This is worthless. This is a waste of my time. What do I need to do this for? And so the foolish person is the person that looks at the very thing that the wise person loves and values and seeks and says, this is a waste of time. This isn't worth it. I despise it. In verse 7, we learn the key to wisdom and the key to this book, and it says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the starting line of knowledge. Keep your finger there, but turn over to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. See a corollary verse as he says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning. The fear of the Lord is the starting line of wisdom. The starting line is the fear of the Lord for wisdom and for knowledge. Now, before we go on too far in this book, I want to, uh, there's one more tool I gave you in your bulletins that you're going to have that so your own study as you go through it. This is essential to understand if you want to understand uh, the book of Proverbs. It's a handout on liter literary devices. Big word, big stuff. I'm going to make it real simple for you real quick. We're going to look at letter B, parallelism. It's the key to understanding a proverb. Parallelism is simply this using different words to communicate the same idea. Different words to communicate the same idea. The first line communicates the idea that's trying to be emphasized, and this, uh, the, the first line emphasizes, the second line nuances it in some way. It does something to further highlight the first one. And the key to understanding a proverb is the interplay between the first and the second line. So you don't just read, sh -t, sh -t, but you read sh -t, sh -t, and say, whoo, how do these things connect? How do they relate to one another? And there's three ways that parallelism relates to one another. 
The first one is called uh, synonymous parallelism, and that's basically agreement. That's when the first line says something, and the second line basically echoes it. It says the same thing in different words so that you can do this. This is what, what the nuance between the two is and the interplay is this. The second line is giving you a different window to look in the same room. Milt's over there looking in that window. Jesse's over there looking in that window. Gary's looking through this window. You see, we're all looking at the same place through different windows, so we see different angles on it. And when you're dealing with synonymous parallelism, you're looking at the same truth, but now you're seeing it from a different light with a different angle, a different window, just a different nuance to help you better understand it. The second kind is called uh, antithetical parallelism, and that's where there's disagreement. First one agrees and gives us the second one means this. Basically, the second line is contrasting the first line by giving us an opposite. And so now as you compare the opposites to each other, you learn something because the emphasis is in the first line. And so as you compare the opposites, you see something about that first line to better understand it. We just read one of those. That was uh, Proverbs 1.7. Talks about the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. They're opposites. It's there to contrast and give us some understanding a little bit more of what it means to fear the Lord. The third kind is called uh, synthetic parallelism, and that's where it expands the idea of the first one. Somehow the second line refines what was said, it develops what was said, or it completes what was said in the first line. So I give that to you for your own studies, but that's also important for us to understand the passages we'll be looking at this morning. And as we move forward in the book of Proverbs, understanding parallelism will help you get the insight into the depth of the wisdom that God is trying to teach us through these words. So let's get started. The key to wisdom, the starting line, we just read it in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 antithetical parallelism, contrast by opposites. The beginning point of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. It's the line we must get to if we want to understand knowledge the way that God intended it to be known. I I love a passage, I think it's in 1 Corinthians, I think 8, I'm probably wrong on the reference, but he only says this. If any man thinks he knows anything at all, he has yet not learned as he ought. Think about that for a while. You think you know a lot? It's evidence that you don't yet know the way God wants you to know. So if you're here this morning, say, I know a lot. I don't need this. I don't need anything more. I don't, you know, I, I know a lot. The point is, if you think you know anything, you haven't yet learned as you ought. And as we go on this morning and understand the fear of the Lord, we'll understand that's exactly what he's talking about. And so the starting line I have to get to, if I ever want to understand knowledge from God's perspective and the one who created knowledge and created this world, created us, I have to start with the fear of the Lord. We just saw in Proverbs chapter 9 what they call a um, synonymous parallelism that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you want to be wise, if you want to know knowledge, you've got to get up to the starting line. It's the fear of the Lord. Now, before I go on, I just want to, I'm going to explain to you in a second what the fear of the Lord is. I'm going to try to bring that on the lower shelf for us and tell us why that's important. But before I do that, You need to understand that knowledge and wisdom are closely related to one another in the book of Proverbs. Matter of fact, many people define wisdom as the skillful use of knowledge. It's the ability to apply knowledge at the right time, in the right place, in the right situation, in the right way. And so uh, wisdom and knowledge go hand in hand with one another. Bruce Walke, who's known to be, they say he's the foremost scholar in the book of Proverbs. He must be. His commentary costs like a hundred bucks, so 
you know, that, that says something right there. But the thing's about this thick, too, you know, so it's... He said this. He, he believes this is the reason why our culture is really going in the tubes. And when I think about this, I got to tell you, when I'm going to share with you in a second, you're going to go, what? It was one of those things I had to look at over and over again. And the more I thought of it, the more I saw the truth of it. The more you understand this, the more you'll understand the fear of the Lord. But it really explains why our culture is heading the wrong direction and why many individual lives are going the wrong direction, even of believers in Jesus. This is what he said. You cannot live well without comprehensive knowledge. Live, live well, what's that skill of living? Wisdom, right? You can't have wisdom without comprehensive knowledge. Comprehensive knowledge means I know everything. So what he's saying here simply is, is that you cannot be wise without knowing everything. And without comprehensive knowledge, you can have no certain knowledge. What he means by this if you don't know everything then what you think you know you really can't be certain in that that you really have got it right therefore we have to have a revelation that's a word from God to know what's right and what's wrong let me read that one more time I want you to think on this this one is uh, worth meditating on this week because the truth of it will be get fuller and fuller you cannot live well without comprehensive knowledge. And without comprehensive knowledge, you can have no certain knowledge. Therefore, we have to have a revelation to know what is right and wrong. Now, taking it from the guy who it cost 100 bucks to get his commentary to the guy you could probably buy for a nickel, that's mine, and bring it down like this, this is the way I paraphrase this. You cannot be wise without knowing everything. There is to know. And without knowing everything there is to know, then you can never be certain what you know is right or wrong. Wise or foolish. Therefore, we need a word from God. The only one who knows everything. Everything in the past, the present, and the future knows the conscious and subconscious thoughts and motivations of every person's heart and even knows every possibility if we would have done, I had to do, but meant to have done this or that. And the Bible is the place where God, who knows everything, has made his thoughts known to us on what's right and what is wrong and what is foolish and what is wise. Anybody in here know everything? Isn't that what's happened to our culture? Isn't that what we see going on? We've removed God, and we've removed his word. We've moved it from the schools. Thank God for Christian schools and parents and homeschoolers who continue to bring the word of God back to their kids, but our schools have removed God and his word. The political world has removed God and his word. The courthouse has removed God and his word. Our marriages have removed God and his word. Our parenting has removed God and his word. Our values, our morals. And instead, we have people who have very, 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 very little knowledge compared to God that we call experts. And they're the ones that are telling our culture what's right or wrong. You following me? Guys, nobody knows everything. Nobody. I think of some of the issues that are taking place right now in our culture. And you know, it's so many decisions about right or wrong are made in a small little window, and that's called political agenda. But they've never taken into consider, and, I, and I'm talking about Democrats and Republicans, guys. This isn't a statement about this or that. I don't care what side of the fence you're on. Political agendas drive a lot of stuff, and they never consider everything else that needs to be known on the impact of their decisions and all the other 
fields of learning that there are in the world, but even if they knew everything that there was in the field of world, world of learning and had all the experts together, guess what, guys? All them together are like a thimble full of knowledge compared to an ocean of knowledge that God knows. And they're the ones that are making decisions for our culture. And you wonder, why are things going the way they are? It's because people who do not have complete knowledge are making decisions about what's wise and what's healthy and what's right or wrong. But here's something more important than the culture. Maybe not more important, because we live in it. The world squeezes us into it, but just as important. Have you removed, Christian, have you removed God and his word? from your decision making, from your finances, from your relationships, from your marriage, from your parenting, from your speaking and communication to others, your education, your work. See, if you have, because of the fact you don't know everything there is to know, if you remove God and his word from it, you can never be wise, you can never be wise. And you know what? I'm so concerned about Christians because you know what we do. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. And I'm asking God to keep growing me. We get on automatic pilot. I have my time in the Word this morning. I read my Bible for 15 minutes. I said my prayers. I went to church. Well, my question is, did you meet with God this morning? Did you encounter the God of the universe as you were in the Word? Were you humbled by the knowledge of who he is? Was your life transformed by that word? As you walked out of the house this morning, was Jesus in your conscious thoughts because Jesus is God? Did you realize he knows everything? He's the one I need to trust for everything I need today. As I come to church, that I come expect, I say, God, would you so meet me that my life would be turned upside down and I'll never be the same? Or did you come on automatic pilot this morning and say, I gotta go to church again. And let me get my coffee on the way in, by the way. See, guys, that's the difference. And so many of us Christians are just living on automatic play. Yeah, we're going to heaven. We got our ticket to ride. And we're, we're, we're guaranteed heaven because God's word is secure. But if you want to be wise, it's a whole different thing than living the Christian life on automatic pilot. It's the fear of the Lord. So what is the fear of the Lord? What is the fear of the Lord? It's not about being afraid of God. Even though there's an element of fear in there, but listen to me all the way through. It's more about a high respect. A carefulness around God because you're aware of how great and how powerful he really is. Now, as I talk about God this morning and as we talk about the fear of the Lord. Remember, Jesus is God. I'm not going to try to explain all the Trinity stuff this morning, first of all, because I can't explain it all. I just believe it all. <laughs> but Jesus is God. And so think of your relationship with Jesus this morning as you think about what we're saying. But the fear of the Lord is this, taking God's word seriously. That means that I accept his word as a matter of life and death. That means that I really believe that his promises are secure, but his threats are just as real. You follow me? I take this book for real. If God says it, I believe it. If God says this is good, God, I believe it's good. If God says it's bad, I believe it's bad, even if I don't understand it all, because I can't. And many times we find in the scripture connected with the fear of the Lord turning away from evil. You heard in that skit this morning, our wise man, Ricky Parra, talked about to the doctor what he'd been doing. He says, I've been taking God's word serious because I recognize he knows way more than I do. And I've been turning away from evil. When you look at the fear of the Lord and you trace it through the scripture over and over again, it's connected with turning away from evil. And I think this is what it means. I take God's word serious enough 
that if God says to go down that road will destroy you and hurt you and bring death to your relationships and to your soul and to your life, I turn away from that because I believe what God says. You see, that's what it means, fear of the Lord and turning away from evil. I recognize how powerful and how great and how awesome God is. I'm aware of that. I believe what he says in his word. I take it serious. I believe it's a matter of life or death. And if I don't listen to him and I go down this road that God says don't go down, I'm going to be in big trouble. So what happens if you fear the Lord? I take his word seriously. I'm going to turn away from evil. And I'm going to walk the way that God told me to walk. I want to try to illustrate this. Uh, many of you know I used to be the custodian here at Moraine. And I was clearly one of those custodians that's a cleaning guy. Maintenance guys, you know, they know how to fix things. I'm a zero on maintenance. My wife knows that. and Tried a few things around the house and it still looks like a zero. But it's a lot cheaper to do it that way than any other way. But you know, I was here and the air conditioning was down. And we had the air conditioning guy come, and uh, we had the, down on the side of the gym, those that work with the clubs have seen this storage room that we have that we keep uh, some things in. And on this one wall is this gigantic wall of circuits. And Mark, I understand nothing about electricity, brother. You, you know what I'm going to say here. And, you know, so we got this whole thing. So the guy says, which one turns off the air conditioning? I said, whoa. I said, I have no idea. I said, you want me to call up Harold Skoda? He was our electrician at that time. I said, you want me to call Harold? He'll come over or he'll tell us. Ah, oh, no, I can figure it out. All I know is this guy pulled something. And this, I'm not talking about little fuses like we put in our car now, man. I'm talking about these big circuit breakers that go with, you know, this kind of stuff. And he did something, man. And all I know is there was a gigantic boom! And a white light that flashed across the whole room. And I honestly, I'm like, I really thought I just died. This is what dying's like. <laughs> they talk about seeing this big white light. I just saw it. it. You know, I really thought I was dead. But I didn't die. I don't have one of those books to write on coming back or sermon to tell on that. And I was like, wow, man, that, that got my attention. I said to the guy, you want me to call Harold? He says, yes, call him. <laughs> you know, guys, I'm not afraid of electricity. Every time electricity's in the air, I don't go running away from it scared. But I have a deep respect for electricity now. I have a great awareness of how powerful and what electricity can do if not handled carefully and well. I take electricity very serious. I'm the only guy that when you're gonna change a, a little light switch, I go down and I turn off the main circuit breaker just to make sure I don't blow up the house somehow. I just, you know, I just, I just don't get it. I don't, you know, all I know is it's big, it's powerful, and I'm gonna be real careful when I walk around it. And guys, that's what the fear of the Lord is, our God. Our Jesus is big. He's powerful. He's not just our friend. He's our holy, magnificent God who created the world by just speaking it into existence. And all of a sudden, I reckon, and believe it or not, his spirit lives inside of every believer. And now I recognize and I take very serious what this Jesus says and what his word says. And if he said it, then I'm going to believe. He said, don't go there, then I'm not going to go there. If he says, go here, I'm going to go there. And I recognize how powerful and how awesome he is. And I'm very careful when I walk around Jesus. Yes, he loves me. And scripture says he is my friend. But guys, you know what? He's more. He is so big. He is so huge. He is God. He is powerful. He is magnificent. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are his thoughts above ours. His power, it says the creation of the worlds was the work of his fingers. Work of his fingers, that's finger work. Picking up the paper is finger work. You know, picking up this thing, man, I gotta use my back, my legs. 
uh, arms and take some Advil afterwards. You know, they, they, but the creation of this world, finger one. That's the Jesus that we walk with. That's our God. Do you take him serious? Do you take his word serious? Do you take it so seriously he says, you need to go here, I'm going to go there. He says, you don't want to go there, I'm going to turn away from there, and I'm not going to go there. So this is, this is the starting line in Pat Pegelow's words as I try to summarize some of this. I come to a decision in life, or I come to a problem, and I recognize I'm not smart enough to solve this. Why? Because I don't know everything. Got to confess, I was in a situation a couple weeks ago. I walked into it. I said, I know what this needs, and I know what they need. And I kind of, it's like God confronted me. He says, Pat, do you really know what they need? Do you really know what's in their thoughts? Do you know what's in their subconscious? Do you know their motives? Do you know their history? Do you know what happened to them this morning? You know, you know what I mean? And we always walk in like, I know, I know, I know. No, I don't know. And if you want to be wise, the first thing you got to realize is you need to know what you don't know and you need to admit it. And so I come to a situation and I recognize that I'm not smart enough. This thing is bigger than I'm smart. But I'm going to bow at the feet of the one who does know everything. And I'm going to trust him. And I'm going to ask him to give me the wisdom that I need because God... You're the only one with comprehensive knowledge. And your word, you revealed your thoughts. And so I prayerfully seek God's word, and I seek God in prayer. I say, God, would you give me your wisdom for this situation? Because that's what it means to walk in the fear of the Lord. James 1.5 says this, if anybody lacks wisdom. Let them ask of God. Of course, who are we going to turn to? You don't know what to do? You turn to God. You know what I love about this verse? We're going to see this later on in chapter 9 of Proverbs. God has ministered hugely to me in this. And I don't know if the grammar is right, but you guys will accept that. You don't have to be real smart to be wise. What you have to be is humble enough to admit it. <laughs> that I'm not that smart. That's the beginning of wisdom. Because I'm going to fall down on my face before the one who knows it all. And I'm going to say, God, I lack wisdom. I lack knowledge. I lack what it takes to make this situation work right. And so I seek the one who knows everything. So let me ask you this in closing. If you're here today and you don't know G the, you don't know God, triune God, God the Father, Jesus said something very important to us in John 14. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You want to know the starting line of a relationship with God? It's Jesus. He is the way. He is the only way. Religion, denomination, knowing the right theology, uh, being real moral, doing good things is not the way. Jesus is the only way. And just like wisdom, this is the way you do it. You're humble enough to say, you know what, Jesus? God is holy and I'm not. God is perfect and I am not. I need to admit, that's what sin is, falling short of God's holy, righteous standard. God is perfect, I'm not, and God, I'm going to be humble enough to admit today, I am not, compared to you, God, I'm in deep trouble. And your word tells me that if I don't believe in Jesus, that I'm going to die in my sins and go to a real place called hell. And if I take God's word serious, I believe when he says there's a hell, there really is a hell. And when he says there's a fire, there really is a fire. And it's a place of torment forever, like he said. You follow me? That's what the fear of the Lord says. And so today, to know God, you need to be humble enough to say, God, I don't match up to the kind of person you call me to be. 
Jesus is the only one that does. And Jesus said that if we will put our trust in him, he will forgive our sins and as a gift give us his righteousness so that we can come into a relationship with a holy God. So if you want to be wise today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you haven't come to God through Jesus, that's your starting line this morning. Come into a personal relationship with God through Jesus by means of faith. But what if you're a believer? This is my third attempt on the ending for a believer. I, I started with one, I said that was very vanilla. Went to the next one, I said it's a great illustration but means nothing. Then God reminded me yesterday as I kept on praying, I said I just don't like the way this is ending for the believer. You need to know this. The fear of the Lord is not just the starting line that I need to get up to. You follow me? I gotta get to the starting line. And then we almost act like, I got to the starting line, I started the race. I'm leaving the starting line behind and I'm going on to bigger and better things. That is not what the, the beginning means. What it means is he's the foundation. He is the everything. He's not, it's not like I start with Jesus and I start with fearing God and I start with this, this humility before God that has a high respect of him and his word and a carefulness about him and taking him seriously. It's not that I start there, then I move on to bigger and better things, but that's the foundation of everything that I do throughout the rest of my life. Remember Solomon wrote a book called Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes means preacher. Solomon preached a sermon and he put it in here. Same guy who wrote Proverbs, by the way. It was the same guy. The Bible says is the wisest man that ever lived on earth, with the exception, of course, of Jesus Christ. He's the one who wrote this book. He's the one who preached the sermon in Ecclesiastes. You know what he did in that book? He did this. If you're newer to the church, we, we studied through that book. I'd encourage you to pick up the series. But this is what Solomon did. He was like a scientist in the laboratory of life, testing life to find out what gives value and worth to life. And so he tried out all kinds of things it talks about in the book. He tried all kinds of possessions and beauty. He tried pleasure of every kind. He had women, he had sex. It talked about drinking. It talked, you know, this guy had many wives. It had all kinds of things. He said he had parks. He had knowledge. You know, he, he, he went after understanding everything there is to know. He had fame and success throughout the world. He tested life with the wisdom that he had like a skillful man bringing it to life and testing all these things say, is this going to bring value to my life? Is this going to bring worth to my life? Is this going to make my life worth living? You follow me? That was the test. And he gives us this conclusion. If you got your Bibles open, Ecclesiastes is the book right after Proverbs, chapter 12, the very last chapter, the 13th verse. You got to see this. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says this. The conclusion. I was, Psalm saying, when all said and done, I, 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 I'm done with the experiment. I've done it all. I found my results. I'm going to give you the results now. Here it is. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments. But listen to this, because this applies to every person. This is what it says literally in the Hebrew. This is the whole of man. You know why you want to fear God and keep his commands? Because this is the whole of man. In other words, this is the manish of man. This is what makes a man a man. This is what makes you what you were created for. If you're a man in this room, when you fear God and keep his commandments, you become a whole man the way God created you to be. This is what you're created for. And if you're a woman, this is the womanish of woman. And to fear God and keep his commandments will cause you to become all 
the woman that God created you to be. It's the heart of what it means to be a woman. It's the heart of what it means to be a man. This is what we're created for. This is what will make you whole. This is what will give meaning and fulfillment to your life. Guys, the fear of the Lord isn't just the beginning of wisdom in the sense I get to the starting line and move on. It's the essence of our life. And as you want to live life and find meaning and value in your life, walk with God in his word. Take him very seriously. Be aware of who he really is. And walk carefully with our God, step by step, word by word, thought by thought, not just Bible study to church to ministry, but everything in our lives. Father, I pray for myself and my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that uh, how desperately we need your Holy Spirit to make us people that fear the Lord, who are people that don't just get in the habit, in the rut of living in our Christian habits, But God, we're people who walk every moment aware of the great power that you hold and the great knowledge that you have and the awesomeness of who you are. And God, that in light of that, we walk carefully taking your word seriously. And when you say go there, we go there. And when you say don't, we don't. So Lord, I just pray. I pray for me. I pray for us. God, would you make us men and women who fear you? And God, that as we do, that every woman in this place would find out what it really means to be a woman. And every man in this place would find out what it really means to be a man. And God, that we would find out that the essence of life, what we're created for, the place we find meaning and value is walking humbly with our God and obeying him. It's in Jesus' name I pray.